So this morning we're going to be in Genesis chapter 46. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to follow along. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one scattered around the room somewhere in the seat underneath the seat someplace. Genesis 46, we're going to begin in verse 1. The question that we're going to answer this morning, I don't know if you remember the question I asked last week. Uh, leading into this week, the question was, is it right for Jacob to leave the promised land in order to rescue the promised people? And this week we're going to have an answer for that question in chapter 46. As we look at Jacob and the situation that he is in, now remember, Joseph has been uh, in Egypt. He's now risen to power. He's been in control. He's recognized his brothers who have come to Egypt during a time of famine to find food. And God has used Joseph, put him in a position so that he can take care of his family during this time of famine. And now uh, it has become known to Joseph that his father is alive. The invitation has been given for Jacob to come and live in the land of Goshen in Egypt. And Jacob is now in this position where he's starting to make his way towards Egypt, but he still has some questions and some concerns about this decision. He's still struggling with whether or not this is a good idea, a bad idea. You guys can relate, can't you? You ever been in a situation where you had to make this big decision, a, a, not just a little decision, but a life-altering decision? There are moments that come along Decisions that we make in those moments, they have these profound ramifications. They change the whole world for our family, for ourselves, the whole structure around us. Sometimes we move to a new place, and uh, it's a new body of believers. Sometimes it's a big transition. And uh, we recognize that these things happen. There are times when God moves us along, and we have to wrestle with those decisions that are that are made. Uh, according to the uh, Salt Lake Tribune, there was an uh, article that was put out, I think it was in 2018, they're talking about there was one out of every six Utahns moved in 2018. So one out of every six people moved during that year, which means there's a lot of people moving. Uh, Utah is a very transient place, and I'm just saying there's going to be people that come, and we're going to have to work through them as they make those decisions and as they uh, you know, search God and, and his uh, direction for them. There's also going to be times when people move away and times when we have to search God and uh, seek out what he wants for you as he moves you away. There's a, ch there's a chance that uh, you will have to make one of those kinds of decisions or you'll have to deal with someone who's making those kinds of decisions um, at some point fairly soon in the future, right? Okay, so... This morning, as we look at Genesis 46, um, my main proposition this morning is that we should consult God when we need to make a decision. Consult God when we need to make a decision. Background and setting. Uh, remember, Joseph, as I mentioned, he sent his brothers back to get his father. Jacob has been invited to Egypt, the land of Goshen. He's making this journey, but this journey has left him questioning things. And he needs some answers. He has concerns. As we see from the text, in a moment, he has even some fears about this decision. Remember, he has been promised a land, a very special land. Abraham and Isaac both given this promise, and they are looking forward to this promise of land. And now Jacob is put in a situation where he's either got to stay in the land and suffer, or move to Egypt. This is going to be good. But first we must pray. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you give us um, direction as we try and make different decisions, as we go through life, whether it be a little decision or a big decision, we know that you uh, are with us, that you have given us promises, that you are giving us comfort, that you give us direction. 
And uh, I pray that you would help us. Uh, if there's someone here in this room this morning that is making a, a big decision even now, I pray that you would use this text to encourage them and give them um, what they need to be able to make that decision. Father, you know the people around us that are making these different decisions um, on a regular basis. I pray that this morning you would better equip us to minister to those people who are in the process of making decisions. I pray that you would uh, help us this morning uh, to see the way that you interact uh, with Jacob. And I pray that it would provoke us towards worship. We recognize the the care and the attention that you give to Jacob as he is making this decision. Father, I pray that you would help me as I speak. Help me to say things clearly, easily understood. I pray that you'd help me to only say the things that you would want me to say. I pray that you'd help my flesh not to have any part in what is said this morning. I pray that it would all be easily received and that you would give all of us um, just a a mind to listen and understand, give us soft hearts so that we might know how to best apply these truths. Thank you for the grace that you've shown us already this morning in letting us be able to worship together. I pray that you would continue to bless us as we study your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, We'll begin reading in verse 1. So Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, he said, here I am. He said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will close your eyes. Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father, Jacob, and their little ones, and their wives, and the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They took their livestock and their property, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and came to Egypt. Jacob and all his descendants with him, his sons and his grandsons with him, his daughters and his granddaughters, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. I'm going to stop right there, and we're going to go back, and we're going to break this down just a little bit. Let me kind of help you um, get into the mind of Jacob and why this is such a struggle for him, why he is trying to figure out what God would want for him, why there is fear in his heart as he thinks about leaving this promised land. I remind you, the land we're talking about is the same land that we have been talking about since Genesis chapter 12. So for these many chapters, uh, much of this has had something to do with the land. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make our name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in all the families of the earth, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So he's thinking about this promise that has been made to Abraham. And this promise is not only made to Abraham, but it's also made, reiterated for Isaac. In Genesis 26 and verse 1, it says, Now there was a famine in the land, besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Now, this land is a special land, and there was a famine at one point in time. When Isaac is trying to figure out, Okay, what do I do? I don't have food. And in this time with Isaac, God said, Don't go to Egypt. So now, we have Israel, Jacob, trying to figure out, Well, do I go to Egypt or do I not? That passage continues, Do not go down to Egypt, stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands. So the point is, you stay here because I'm giving you this land. And I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. Going back to the promise that was made with Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and will give your descendants all these lands. 
and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, my laws. So this promise carried on to Isaac, and this promise was also reiterated with Jacob. So certainly now, Jacob is in a situation where he knew from his father and his grandfather the importance of this land. Not only does he know from them, but he knows from God the importance of this land. He has once in his past abandoned the land, but then returned to it. He's been living in this land for many years. He's come the closest now of all the patriarchs to having a, quote, nation. He's got 12 sons. A lot of progress made in the family, right? And now Jacob is faced with this decision. Probably the biggest decision of Jacob's life. He has a chance to reunite with his son Joseph. He wants to go and see his son Joseph, the beloved son, right? The one who he gave the special garment to. The one who was favored above all the brothers. And now he's got a chance. He thought he was dead. After 22 years of thinking that he's dead. And now he's like, well, what should I do? So he takes this first step in moving to, towards Beersheba. Beersheba is on the way out of Canaan and towards Egypt. He stops there. And out of the, out of, uh, on the way out of Canaan, this is this last stop, and he remembers this place. Do you guys remember this place? It was at this place that Abraham and Abimelech made a covenant. Abraham gave Abimelech the seven ewe lambs as a witness that Abraham dug the well, and he called it Beersheba, the well of the oath, right, or well of the seven. He's kind of playing with words there, the seven lambs that are given, and there's also the oath that is made between Abraham and Abimelech. And there, at that place, Abraham called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. It's just after this that God would test Abraham, bringing him to the point of uh, really seeing if he was willing to offer his son Isaac on the altar. Just after this point where Abraham has this moment in Beersheba with God. Genesis 21 Isaac also came to Beersheba when he and his men were looking for water. He kept getting pushed out by the men of Gerar, and the Lord appeared to Isaac. And in Genesis 26, verse 24, he says, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. This is Beersheba. So Beersheba in the past has been a place of worship. It's been a place of worship for Abraham. It's been a place of worship for Isaac. And you can only imagine the things that are going through Israel's mind as he comes past this place. And I'm sure Abraham and Isaac have, you know, conveyed all the things that have happened there in that place. This time of meeting with God. It is in this place that um, Isaac has this, uh, this appearance the Lord appears to Isaac in this place. I'm sure he was telling his son of these things. So it is likely that as Jacob begins to make his way out of Canaan, that now he's on the edge on God's, of God's promised land. He's on the edge of the land, and he's remembering all these times that his father and his grandfather called on God there. And he's still afraid. He's trying to figure out this. He's feeling some concern, some fear about leaving this land. And now... He's faced with the largest decision of his life. What does he do? He decides he's going to worship. He offers sacrifices there. Possibly even on the same altar that Isaac had built. I'm just going to tell you, when you're trying to make a decision, worship is usually a good option. It's not usually our first option, our go-to option, but it is a good option. And you need to make a decision. Your first move, your first priority should be that I'm going to make sure that I'm right with God. You have to make a decision. You first consider what God has for you. And often that means taking a little step at a time. Now, as Jacob is thinking through this, he's already moving, right? He's already moving towards Egypt. He's gone from, from one place to now Beersheba, and he's on the edge, and he's, he's making his way towards Egypt that decision, and he's still seeking God's answer. And often when we're put in that position, it means we just take one small step at a time, 
not, might not be able to make the whole decision, the big decision in that one, one fell swoop, but we might be able to see, okay, I know that I need to get to that place. And that place is a good place to worship. That's a good place for me to reconnect with God. And what we see in verse 2 through 4 is that God gives Jacob guidance. And in these verses, we see that God reminds Jacob who he is. God promises Jacob that he will still make him a great nation. He promises him that he will go with him. He promises him a return. He promises him a reunion with Joseph. And as he's struggling with this fear, God comes in and says, wait, let me just remind you who I am. Can I make some promises to you? Let me, let me clarify some things. So in a vision, God calls out to Jacob. and He says, here I am, as if God didn't know where he was. <laughs> Let me remind you that this text is a descriptive text, not a prescriptive text. We should not go into decision, uh, making decisions and expect God to speak audibly to us. I'm not saying you can't do that, but I'm saying that's not how he operates. Now we have his word that gives us that direction, that instruction. There's a right way and a wrong way to do that too, right? We don't go seeking God's will and we flip up in our Bible and we put a finger on a verse and we say, okay, this is what God wants from me. There was a man who did that. And uh, he flipped open and uh, he read, read the passage and he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed and he went away and hanged himself. He's trying to figure out God's will and he's, oh, he hanged himself. He's like, surely this is not what God wants from me. And so he flips a few more pages and throws his finger in there. And uh, he reads the passage that, uh, uh, he reads the passage and it says, go and do the same. Oh, this is getting a little serious. In frustration, he tried once more and flips open and puts his finger in there and it says, what you do, do quickly. <laughs> well, it gets kind of scary when you start looking at the Bible that way, right? That's not how we handle it, okay? So how do we seek God's guidance? How do we make these decisions in seeking his guidance? Well, Jacob went to him offering sacrifices. He went to him in worship. And I say, first of all, just make sure that your relationship with him is as it should be. Make sure there's nothing that is, uh, no unconfessed sin in your life. Make sure there's nothing that's hindering your relationship with him. And secondly, I say that part of this worship would be to pray. God has given us this um, incredible um, way to commune with him and we can bring our request directly before his throne don't neglect these things and so we go to him we remember who he is and this very much goes along with this idea of worshiping him so God reminds Jacob who he is he reminds him of his person he says, I am God, the God of your father. There's no mistake who God is. He's not going to, uh, God is basically clarifying for Israel. Israel in the past has been a little bit, um, let's say, slow. So he makes it clear, this is who I am. I'm the God of your father. There's no mistaking who God is. When we need direction, it helps to remember who God is. It may seem like an odd way to make a big decision, but when you focus on the character and the nature of his person, it enables us to see things through the right lens. It gives us a proper perspective on the situation. He reminds Jacob that he was the, the God of Isaac, this is a, a reminder in some ways of what God had done in the past, and he brings Jacob's memory to, uh, he brings to his memory the testimony of Isaac and what God has done for Isaac. He says, look, don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. Why is the question, and why should he not be afraid? Jacob was struggling with this decision. He was afraid. It seems like this is connected in some ways to this next promise. He says he was fearful that I think he was fearful that he might not make a, uh, there might not be a great nation if he left to go to Egypt. There's something about Egypt that is scary to Jacob. 
He's afraid. He says, look, don't be afraid. I'm going to make you a great nation there. I'm going to keep my promise to you. Maybe he thought that his sons could possibly be injured by going there or killed. He had some fears about Egypt before. Remember, he wouldn't send Benjamin because he wanted to protect Benjamin. When we're making these different decisions, when we make these different uh, big decisions, fear will always complicate the decision. It complicates the decision-making process. I'd say the, all, the opposite, then, of this fear is than to walk in faith. Trust God as you go through making these big decisions. Knowing who he is then will enable you to be able to trust him. Our faith gets built, grows as we learn more, as we know more about who he is, about his character, about the nature of God. So God says, look, don't be afraid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you. And he promises that he will still make Jacob a great nation in Egypt. He's still keeping this promise to make them a, a great people. This is an affirmation that leaving that promised land doesn't mean that God will not keep his promises. And that was ultimately the big dilemma for Jacob. Will I mess things up if I leave? God says, I will keep my promises. There's no need to fear. Just go back to my promises. I think it's interesting to notice that God doesn't give him this information, um, you know, years or months or even days in advance. He gets to the last possible moment. He's getting ready to go out of the, the promised land and into Egypt. And the last possible moment, God gives him this instruction. This is so much how God works, right? He brings us to the last possible minute. And then gives us what we need. He will always answer us. Usually it's later than we'd like. Rarely is it early. But he's always on time, right? So God, he promises him that he will not only continue to keep his promises, but he also promises him that he will go with him. He says, look, my presence is going to be with you. God is not confined to a specific location. He promises Jacob that he will go with him. Now, we're not Jacob, right? So we can't jump in and say, well, it's the exact same thing. But what we can do is we can look at other passages that say the exact same thing for the believer. In Hebrews 13, 5, it says, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? As you make those different decisions, it's, just, it's, helpful, it's helpful to remember that God is with you at point A, he's with you at point B, and he's with you anywhere in between. This is an incredible comfort when making these huge decisions. Again, it keeps these things in the right uh, perspective and these right priorities. We're not alone as we go through this process of discerning God's will. So in this decision-making process, Jacob turns to God. He is reminded who God is. He is reminded of what God has promised to do. And he has promised that God will be with him. Next, we see that God promises him a return. So at this point, Jacob may be tempted to think, okay, so no Canaan? God says, I will still keep my promises. Remember, God has already made this known. Jacob just needs to remember, right? Genesis chapter 15, God gave this prophetically to Abraham. Genesis 15 and verse 13 through 16, God says to Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nations whom they will serve. And afterward... They will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So God promises him this return. And some simple application that we get from this is to go back to what God has said. Figure out what he said in his word. 
He's already given him this information. So I said, look, I'm going to take you out. You're going to go into this foreign land, and then I'm going to bring you back. Go back to what God's word says. <clears throat> God also promises this reunion with Joseph. The encouragement Jacob needed to hear. He would finally have the chance to see his son Joseph again. The decisions that we make, they should always be Christ-centered. There will be times when we make Christ-centered decisions and they, they come with an added benefit. It's like we make a Christ-centered decision and all of a sudden we see, oh, well, there's something really cool that God was doing over here that I didn't notice. Or it comes with something else that is beneficial or a blessing in some way. Notice that the decision-making process didn't start with Joseph. It starts with God. But it ends with Joseph. The benefit shouldn't be the primary way we make our decisions. I think we often make our decisions because of the benefit more so than because of what we want to do in following Christ. You say, well, this is an opportunity for me to make more money. This is an opportunity for me to have a better position, a better job. This is an opportunity for me to have a nicer school for my kids, cleaner neighborhood, whatever the decision is. Just reminding you that those benefits are not, um, in and of themselves, the way that we should make those decisions. The first decision that Israel makes, that Jacob makes, is the decision to turn to Christ. He remembers who he is, how he should respond in light of knowing who he is. He remembers his promises, remembers that God is going to be with him through it. He says, go back to what I've said, remember what I've said. We make Christ the focus, not, not the benefit the focus. So all of this happens, and one of the things that's interesting to note is that in verse 1, we see Israel uh, called Israel. Now with Jacob, it goes back and forth, right? And when we see him acting more like Jacob, he's called Jacob. When we see him acting more like uh, the name that God has given him, we see him called Israel. And so we recognize that this... He's in a good place as he is seeking the Lord, as he is worshiping him, as God is giving him these promises, this information. Then as we continue in verse 5, Jacob's decision it not only affects him, but it affects his people. This is a big decision for him. It affects the people that he's taking with him, and it affects the people that he's going to. affects the people that he's taking with him. Society today has become very um, individualistic. It's not always a bad thing, but we have been made to live in community. We've been made to live in the family unit, the, the church unit, the, the government structure. All of these things are community focused and they're instituted by God. And so our decisions, they're always going to in some way or another affect those people that are around us. Those who feel the impact the greatest are usually those who are the closest to us. This is one of the reasons uh, this is such a big deal for Jacob. He's now asking 70 plus other people to come with him. He's got the weight of the 70 people. He's got granddaughters, grandsons, sons, daughter, all these different people that are going with him all of his descendants, and this weight is on his shoulders. And thankfully, uh, we have verse 8 through verse 27, which is very hard to read. Um, and I would not suggest this section if you're looking for uh, baby names, um, <laughs> unless you're looking for something odd and a bit obscure. Um, this morning, I, uh, I'll attempt to read this. And uh, if you're a Hebrew scholar, and uh, uh, just show me some grace, right? All right, verse 8. So it says, Now these are the names of the sons of Israel, Jacob and his sons who went to Egypt, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, the sons of Reuben, Hanok and 
Palu, and Hezron, and Carmi, the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, and Jamin, and Ohad, and Jachin, and Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman, the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, the sons of Judah, Ur, and Onan, and Shelah, and Perez, and Zerah, but Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamuel, the sons of Issachar, Tola, and Huva, and Yob, and Shimron, the sons of Zebulun, Sarid, and Elon, and Jahiel. These are the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob and Padanaram, with his daughter Dinah. All his sons and his daughters numbered thirty three. The sons of Gad, Ziphon, Ziphion, and Haggai, Shuni, and Esbon, Eri, and Erodi, and Areli. The sons of Asher, Emna, and Ishva, and Ishvi, and Beriah, and their sister, Surah. And the sons, Beriah, Heber, and um, Mauchai. Jael. These are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to his daughter Leah. And she bore Jacob these sixteen persons, the sons of Jacob's wife Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. Now to Joseph in the land of Egypt, now, jo now to Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him. The sons of Benjamin, Bela and Beker, and Ashbel, Gera, and Naaman, Ehi, and Rosh, Muppim, and Hupim, and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel, who were born to Jacob. There were fourteen persons in all. The sons of Dan, Husham, the sons of Naphtali, Jaziel, and Guni, and Jezer, and Shilam. These are the sons of Bilhah, whom Laban gave to his daughter Rachel, and she bore these to Jacob. There were seven persons in all. And the persons belonged to Jacob and came to Egypt. His direct descendants, not including the wives of Jacob's sons, were sixty-six persons in all. And the sons of Joseph, who were born to him in Egypt, were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were seventy. That's where we'll stop, all right? You guys are all like on the edge of your seat, I can tell. <laughs> this is really exciting stuff, huh? Um, this doesn't mean a whole lot to us, right? Uh, there's not a whole lot about these people. There's not a lot of information. Someone married, uh, let's see, the son of a Canaanite woman. So we know that there's some, uh, they're like pointing out, this is a bad person, watch out. They're doing these different things. Um, so there's a little bit of information here, but not, not really. So there's a lot that is lost uh, between us reading this versus the intended audience. Remember, who is writing this? Moses is writing this. And he's writing it to, he's reminding the people, the nation of Israel, who they are. He's reforming who they are. He's bringing them back to God. He's been all this time bringing them to the point of understanding who they are. Because he's writing this as they have left Egypt and before they go into the promised land, as God begins to bring them to that land and make them a great nation, he's made them a great people. He's going to put them as a great people in that great land and make that a great nation. So there's all these different things that are going on as Moses is trying to communicate all of that. So for you and for me, reading this, it doesn't mean a whole lot. But for them, looking back and seeing what God has done with their ancestors, it probably meant a quite a great deal. As they're understanding, oh, that was my great 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 grandfather or my you know great great uncle or however all this worked out so they're thinking through this they're like oh this is this is how our people ended up in egypt and this is how our people ended up coming out of egypt and they're understanding all of these things as they're being connected together as i mentioned we are a very individualistic society and uh, what we see here is this community that is formed around Israel. 
And his decision is not just a focusing on him and what he does and what he wants, but his decision is impacting the whole nation. It's impacting the 70 plus people. It affects the people that he's going to take with him. It also affects the people he's going to. So see in verse 29. Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father, Israel. So they arrive in Goshen. Joseph goes to meet his father. The Hebrew there is that he is, he's hurrying. He's trying to get there. And it's unusual that Joseph would prepare his own chariot, but he does so quick, quickly, speedily. And he went up to Goshen to meet his father, Israel, as soon as he appeared before him. And as soon as he appeared before him, he fell on his neck and he wept on his neck a long time. Then Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face, that you are still alive. Now he's not saying, I, I'm going, I want to die. He's saying, it's okay if I die, because now I see that you're alive. And he's just so encouraged by seeing his son being basically brought back to life. 22 years he thought that he was dead. This has a great impact on the people that he's going to. As Joseph falls on his neck and they just weep. They weep for a long time. There's not a lot of description here as to what exactly you know they said, or if there's like uh, anything going on in the conversation as they weep together. But it's almost as if the author says like there's there's no words to express how sweet this reunion is. They just fall on each other and they cry. It's a beautiful reunion. After all this time. And you see God's promises fulfilled over and over and over again. Some application from this, just a reminder that your decisions, they're always going to affect other people. They're always going to affect other people. And be careful in how you make those decisions. So we have, in many ways, an example in Jacob. There's not a lot of Jacob's life that we can look at and say, oh, do this. But here's an, op an opportunity for us to say, oh, do this. Worship. Seek God. Remember the promises that God has given. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to see the way that you worked in this family. Thank you that you were careful and loving in the way that you moved Israel towards Egypt. Thank you that we're able to see uh, someone that is so easily uh, relatable. Father, I thank you that, uh, that you have given us promises, that you will always be with us, that you will not leave us, that you will not desert us. I thank you that we're able to come back to your word and uh, understand um, what it is that you desire for us. I pray that you would help us to walk with you uh, steadily so that when we find ourselves in a situation of uh, having to make those decisions, that it will be easy to uh, come before you, that it will be easy to discern what, uh, what you think see us best. Father, I thank you for um, being gracious with us as we make these different decisions. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity to look into this family and see this uh, reunion established ultimately because of Joseph's forgiveness and really, ultimately, because of your hand and all that was going on, bringing uh, salvation, rescuing these people, your people out of Egypt, uh, out of Canaan, and ultimately out of Egypt. Uh, Father, I thank you that uh, you have that same power to work in our lives and to not only to save us from a place, but you have the ability to save us from our sin. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for us, giving us an opportunity, a way of uh, escaping your wrath. 
through our faith in Jesus. Thank you that you sent your son down the cross for us in our place so that we wouldn't have to bear that wrath. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.